Well, good morning, everybody, and thanks so much, guys, for the welcome. And isn't it great to be together at church? I don't know about you, but with everything happening, meeting uh, on Sunday mornings is like an oasis, isn't it not? It's, it's a place where I get to remind myself that there's something greater. I'm able to realign, reconnect with God, with the body of Christ. And I'm just thankful that we have this. And uh, it's not ideal. I know. I wish we could be in person and hug one another and, you know, not have to see through a screen. But this, this is something that is so uh, comforting for my soul and my heart. And I'm just very thankful for that. And uh, just encouraged to be uh, able to uh, bring the message to you guys this morning. We're going to continue our series and call it and send. And, uh, you know, it's been fantastic. I mean, I've been loving this series for many reasons. And the idea of, of call and send, that topic, that theme, is the idea that we have, we serve a missional God. We serve a God that, that has a mission to bring us out to, from our paradigm, our perspective, to a higher ground, and then not only does he call us, but he sends us so we can, you know, find others so we can share the good news with them. And uh, there's a scripture that I, that I think about every time I, I, you know, we start this series of call and send and we look at the different characters. This scripture is in the book of uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, and he reads the following, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who call you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And I think that, that this slide was right there. Okay, there you go. And so this is an awesome, this is, this is a great reminder. This is our identity. We used to be in the darkness, right? I mean, do you remember that? We had no purpose, no mission. Uh, our, our life was going south and then God called us. And he did a 180, and he radically changed our lives. I mean, say yes in the chat if you relate to what I'm saying, right? Your life is totally different. And not only that, he, he called us and sent us. And, uh, you know, many of us have been able to partake in that amazing adventure and just sitting down with other people and saying, especially even right now, right, that we're studying the, conver the conversion studies, following Jesus studies. It's, it's awesome to be, to be able to be part of that. And today... We're going to study yet another character. And I just want to say it's awesome uh, that we, we are able to see human beings that are struggling. Just like you and I, we struggle with the call and the mission of God. We get to see other uh, human beings from the scriptures that, that struggle uh, with the same. And I just want to add to that that it's been awesome to learn about women. And today we're going to learn about another woman that um, is amazing, right? I mean... I, I mean, men and women in the Bible, they're inspiring. We find tons of examples, but uh, just learning more. As a man, I feel like I need to learn more. I mean, I, I, know, I know my own. I know how as a man I think. But to learn about how women think, I mean, after learning about the, this character today, I grow in appreciation to, for example, my wife and her challenges and women in general and, and men in general as well as we live together and are part of this adventure. So today we're going to be learning about Hannah and the title of the lesson is Call to a Deep Devotion. Hannah, Call to a Deep Devotion. And for that, you need to go to the book of 1 Samuel. So go there right now while I put a little bit of the framework for this. And so we've been learning about Gideon and Samson and Deborah. You remember those, right? And those are amazing characters that God called and sent. And they're a part of the judges, right? So in that period of time in the story of Israel, this is a transition happening. In fact, Samuel, this character, is, is going to be the last judge before the time of the kings. And the story that we're going to read is about... Well, Samuel's parents, particularly Samuel's mom, and this is going to be so inspiring to all of us. So let's start reading in verse 1 of chapter 1 of 1 Samuel. You there yet? If not, we're going to put the scriptures up for you. It says the following, There was a certain man from Ramathaim, a suffered from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Saul, the Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, 
He would give portions of meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband, Elkanah, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once, when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow, saying, Lord God Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servants, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk. And said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something that her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord, and they went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. I mean, isn't this a moving story? Um, I don't know. Uh, I know that many of us might be familiar with this story, and, and you hold Hannah in a special place in your heart. Uh, but it is my experience that sometimes we read Bible stories, and we kind of read them quickly. And especially if you've been reading the Bible for some time, we need to take that extra time to look into some of the details to really connect. And I want to do that with all of us together at this time. So uh, there are a lot of things that happen in, in, in Hannah's life that not just one alone, but the collection of all these circumstances could bring anybody down in such a level that you could just completely retreat, completely just want to just escape. So I want us to go through that together. In this next slide, it says that uh, the Lord closed her womb. She was barren. She couldn't have children. I mean, that in itself is huge, right? I mean, if you know anybody that has had that experience, do you? I mean, if you have lived through that yourself, I mean, this is something that is, is so challenging that is beyond words. You know, my wife and I, we have a 13-year-old daughter, and we're so happy. Her name is Acacia. And, um, but previous to that, we, we struggled with having kids. We wanted to have kids, like, the second year after marriage. And, and it took us six years through fertility and, and treatment to be able to get to that point. But I remember, and my wife and I, even when we were talking about the story of Hannah just, just, just a few days ago, we remember we remember how, how tough that was and how, how weird we felt going to places where families had kids and we didn't, right? And my, my heart goes out. Yeah, I need to remind myself how difficult that was. You know, the prayers that I had and the anguish that I felt in my heart. So that alone is huge. Now, the scripture says that, he, that Elkanah, the husband of Hannah, had two wives. And, you know, this is, this is something that... We see in the scriptures, we read about Abraham, you know, we read about Jacob. You know, it was so important back then in that culture that you had someone to, to be your heir, to hand off the things that you had. And so 
if you were in a situation where you were married, you couldn't have kids, then what they will do is just look for someone. This is something that we have read, right? I'm not saying that it's right. But, but just put yourself in that situation, right? I mean, just imagine the love story between Elkanah and Hannah, right? And, and, and the dreams that they had together of a family that they wanted to have together and then realize that, okay, we couldn't have kids this first, this first year, the second year. I don't know how many years went by. And then the conversation comes up. I'm sure it came up in some way, right? Like, hey, you know, um, we're not able to have kids, so I think that we need to bring someone else. I don't know who brought it up. I'm sure, I'm sure it was not Hannah. And can you imagine what happened in Hannah's heart? I mean, to now, to be the first one, to be this, the, the, the wife that Elkanah loved, and to now feel... I don't know, it's just hard to, to just even come up with words, you know, to feel like, okay, now you're not first, you're second. You've been rejected. That is so tough. You know, he says there that year after year they went up to worship. You know, I read some commentaries that he said that this must have been one of the most difficult times for Hannah. Because, it, it, you know, she was going through this struggle. And, you know, in the comfort of her home, nobody else will see that this was a reality, maybe some neighbors. But now she's going to church. Now she's going to worship, right? And everybody gets to see Penina, the other wife, with sons and daughters, or at least two and two, four. And then she's not bringing, she, she doesn't have any children. I mean, have you, have you ever been in that situation where you're going to church and you're just embarrassed? This is what's happening in my life. You know, I feel defeated. You don't even want to go to church, right? I mean, let's be real. Have you ever been there? Because the, 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 the hand has been dealt to you. And she went year after year. It says there that her rival kept provoking her. I mean, it wasn't enough that she was already down. But can you imagine then being kicked well down? This is what, this was ha what was happening. She was being bullied by Penina. You know, they have an interaction Elkanah and Hannah, and, you know, he says, but I, am I not worth more than, than 10 children? And I, I mean, he says there that, that, that Elkanah loved Hannah, and I don't doubt that. But even, you know, husband, you relate to that, right? I mean, sometimes we have the best of intentions, and we say something completely stupid, right? I mean, say amen, right? Type, type it, like, if you relate to what I'm saying. I've done it, right? And... Sometimes, as, as wives or husbands, we feel like we're alone. Nobody connects with what I'm feeling. I mean, sure, I love you, Elkanah, but this is not even the topic that we're talking about. I, I want to have a child, right? So feeling that this connection with relationships are so meaningful to you. He says there that she experienced bitterness of soul. Have you been there? Have you, have you gone dark mode? You know what I mean? He's like, you know what? I don't want to answer phone calls. I don't want to go to church. I don't want to see nobody. I, 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 I'm going to shut down everything. I want to run away. I want to just find the first whole cave in the ground and just go there and stay there. That's depression. That's tough. Right? I mean, again, we read this story, but if, as you start accumulating all these realities, it's very, very difficult. It says, it says then, then, he, then he goes into her prayer. And look what she's saying. She says, if you will look only at my misery. If you only looked. She, she felt overlooked. Have you ever felt overlooked by people? Have you ever felt overlooked by, by the Lord? It's like, Lord, are you looking at my misery? Like, I, I, I read the scriptures, and I read about Jesus, but somehow I'm not feeling connected here. It says that uh, she said, if you remember me, have you ever felt forgotten? You know, all those promises, everything that we read, the good news that we hear, we see other people, and you feel, okay, so where am I in all this? Do you still know who I am? Am I important to you? And then, as she's praying, and she's not moving, you know, she's not making sounds with her, but you cannot hear her prayer, but she's moving her head. You know, she gets misinterpreted by, by Eli, the priest, right? And she says, how long will you keep getting drunk? Implying that 
you know, maybe he is he has seen her before. She's been coming every year. And maybe this has been a practice. And every year the same thing. And in his mind, he's judging her. Imagine that like like how I mean, I I'm a church leader, right? And and I'm a human being and I know that I misjudge people sometimes. I confess it and I and I accept it. I need to repent of that. And I've heard people, and maybe you've been being heard by other spiritual people, people that should know better, right? I mean, it's adding, you know, uh, insult to injury. And so you put all these things together, and this is, a, this is a humongous level of grief. I mean, what will you do? What do many of us do? We quit, we say enough, right? So you know what? I love God, and I know about Him. But hey, you know, there's something else that feels more rewarding. A hobby. We get into sin. Whatever it might be, do you relate what I'm saying? Is this, is this real or not? You know, and just put it in the, in the chat. Put yes, I mean, because this is real. And so what are you going to do after that? What is going to be your next step? It's awesome when we read the script or this story and we get to hear this great example. It, it says, going back to chapter 1, verse 10, it says, In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow saying, O oh Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's mystery and remember me and not forget your servant. I, I just want to say it this way. Prayer is the first step of courage. Listen to me. Look at me. Prayer is the first step of courage. You know, we talk about prayer. And sometimes we, if we overlook prayer, we don't give the value to prayer. But sometimes it's hard to pray. It is. And sometimes you know exactly what you need to say and how you need to come to that space of prayer. And we don't. I mean, can you relate to what I'm saying? This is real. And yes, we, some of us, out of habit, we can even come to the space of prayer and prayer and pray, and God honors that. But we know that our prayers are not the prayers that we are, I mean, you read what Hannah is saying, and she's opening, she's coming naked before the Lord and saying, I feel forgotten, I'm, I'm, I am in, in bitterness of soul, I'm in dark mode. And yet he starts, she starts that prayer saying, O Lord God Almighty, O Lord Sabaoth, O Lord of hosts, O Lord of armies. I mean, she, she has not forgotten or misunderstood who God is, but she's expressing her feelings. She's being real. I mean, when was the last time that you were that real in prayer? I mean, I know I have been, but I, I want to bring it up this way then. What if the prayer is still no? What have you been praying this a month, a year, two years, five years, ten years? What do you do? Is this is something that has been happening for so many years? It seems there's evidence when we read the scriptures. What do you do? Do you keep on praying? Do you keep on opening your heart? And I'm saying, you know what? I'm proud of so many of you that you are you. You're still praying. You're still praying because you know that prayer is the first step of courage. Because you might not be able to make the right decisions and go to the right place, but you're still praying. And that is so valuable. I honor you. I respect you. I look up to you because you're still praying. Don't give up on prayer. Don't give up on being real. That means so much. But I, I want to bring it. I, I want to bring it even deeper. Let's take a deeper dive on this idea of prayer. It's not only prayer. Let's read uh, the next verse. And verse 11 says, But give her a son. And not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I, will get, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. Not only did she came naked and into the presence of the Lord in the space of prayer, but he says, you know what, if you grant me this prayer, I'll give this, this son to you. I mean, I don't know about you, but if God answers one of my prayers, I'm like, I am keeping this, baby. Like, it took me so long to get to this one. Well, I'm keeping it. No, she says, I'm going to give it to you. 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my son to service. Not only that, but he says that no razor will ever be used on his head, so it implies the Nazarite vow. We learn about that with Samson. I mean, on top of giving him to the Lord, you know, this is going to be a higher calling for my son. I'm going to raise him to be a Nazarite. So prayer is a first step for courage. But I want to put it like this. Worship is the first step of courage. It's, it's, it's prayer but it's giving to God, it's worship, it's saying, this belongs to you. I know it's tough, family. I know it's, it's difficult. We've been going year after year and hoping and praying and feeling this grief. But I want to I put it this way, and, and I hope that it, it becomes clear. I really hope that, I, that it's, it becomes clear. And um, maybe God's no is Him wanting for, Him waiting for our yes. Maybe God's no is him waiting for our yes. You know, Samuel was born. He was given to the service in the, in the temple. He became Samuel the priest. He became Samuel the judge, the prophet. He helped Israel in a period of, of history where we're in a transition. It was a very important period of history of transition between the judges and the kings. He was... Counselor to the first king, Saul, and counselor to David, the king. He was so important in the history of, of the people of Israel. But I wonder, I wonder if Hannah would have given, would have given Samuel if she didn't have the struggle. Now, do you connect with what I'm saying? I mean, there's things that we want and we receive and we honestly take for granted. We do. But when there's a struggle, we realize, wow, there's a blessing behind this. And I want to put it like this. It's, God, it's good that God says no to our prayers. I mean, I don't know your situation, and I don't want to be insensitive, and there, there's some no's that are very hurtful. I've experienced that in my life. But in retrospect, as I look back and I go, I thank God that you say no. I'm grateful because maybe that no, it was him waiting for my yes. It was, me, it was him waiting for saying, yes, you know what? This is going to be for your honor, and this is going to be for your glory. This is going to be for your mission. This is going to be for your kingdom. And maybe God is waiting for that because it's going to be for, for him and for us. This is so powerful. I want to wrap up. Uh, I think that you would agree. Hopefully you would agree that Hannah is just a great character to study. And there's so much more there that we don't have time but Hannah, Hannah after, after receiving the blessing of that prayer, answer prayer with Samuel, she, she, she prays again. And this prayer is recorded in 1 Samuel 2. And this is this, I mean, I don't know, maybe you're familiar with the Magnificat. The Magnificat is the prayer of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And some, some uh, commentary is saying that this prayer that Hannah prayer was prayed was was the inspiration for the Magnificat. I just want to read a few verses, and I, I, want, I want you to connect with the tone, with the spirit, with the place where she was in. He says in verse 2 of 1 Samuel 2, There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Do not keep talking so proudly or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows and by him deeds are weighed. The Lord brings death and makes death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be broken. The Most High will thunder from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. There's so much here. We don't have time to go through. You, you can definitely tell the change of tone the spirit, the confidence, the revelation. This is, this is the calling and descending right here that we've been talking about. This is the darkness and the light. She went from being in dark mode to light mode, right? And at the very end, he says, he will give strength to his king. And many, many say that this is prophetic. This is talking about Jesus. 
I mean, sometimes we have no idea what God wants to do. And we're here in the no. The no. But maybe he's saying no because he's waiting for our yes. I want to leave you with a couple things, a couple practicals that I think you would enjoy this week. I want you for this week to watch the movie War Room as a family. I don't know if you heard this movie. It's a Christian movie, and, and it's not a Christian boring movie. I, I you know, this is this is a funny movie. Honestly, we watched it recently as a family, and uh, you know, I put the picture there because there's other movies called War Room that are not related with this topic, but it's a movie about prayer, and I think you will enjoy it. You know, uh, get it and watch it as a family. I think it's gonna be like changing to you. And if you watch it already, watch it again. And for this week, start a prayer chain in your community group, in your small group, in your Bible talk. Start a prayer chain. You know, something that you can do, you know, three times a day. Brothers in the morning, sisters at night or reverse, you know, around the clock, whichever way. But let this week be a time of prayer. A prayer we give our hearts to God. I love you guys. I hope that this has been a blessing to you. See you next time. <laughs>